Good evening. Uh, firstly, I welcome uh, the parents from all over India who've joined us. A big welcome to you and a big welcome to the panelists who've taken their time out. Uh, I hope all of you are staying safe. I hope all of you are looking after your health. And I hope the luck continues to shine and all of us to see through the crisis. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce a panel today. I'd like to uh, first welcome Dr. Nandita Krishna. Dr. Nandita Krishna is the president of, president of the CPR Foundation. She's an environmentalist, educationist, historian, and a writer. She's currently the president of the foundation, and she's also founder of many of the uh, foundation's in initiatives, the CPR Environmental Education, the CPR Institute of Indological Research. She's also founded many educational institutions. And in fact, uh, one of Chennai's and possibly South India's best alternate schooling is run by her, Saraswati Kendra Learning Center for Children. And also she founded the Groove School. Uh, welcome, Dr. Nandita. Thank you. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Malati. Uh, Dr. Malati is, is a teacher and academic leader par excellence. She's worked and led a number of international schools in India and also abroad. Uh, she has this uh, unique record of setting up many schools. She's personally set up 14 international schools, eight CBSC schools, two multi-disability centers in India and Doha. And she also founded Happy Tots, a pioneering early education program, which is now being integrated into mainstream schools. And uh, thank you. And uh, my third panelist is uh, Vidya Shankar. Ms. Vidya Shankar is a chemical engineer. She's turned into an educationist. Uh, she's had a very interesting career as an educator. She has founded the Cascade Family Learning Society. It is a fantastic Montessori resource center for children between anywhere between two and 17 years. And the idea of this uh, resource center that she's created is to bring out the full potential of the children through parental involvement. She's also a child rights practitioner and she conducts workshops on juvenile justice laws related to children. And that's my third panelist. My fourth panelist is uh, uh, Mr. Terence. Terence heads the uh, consumer business in 361 Degree Minds. Uh, Terence has spent more than 20 years enabling thousands of youth's careers. He began his career by enabling uh, thousands of youth in the IT industry. In fact, many of Terence's alumni are all over the world in America and Canada, they're all over the world. And also he, in the middle, he was also part of telecom education where he enabled hundreds and thousands of students. Now he's a part of 360 degree men's where he's continuing the journey of enabling. So Terence is going to be our career expert today. Also Terence has a very unique experience, which is uh, he currently leads the industry credits in the company. Industry credits means he works closely with the industry. So he's constantly aware of what kind of education leads to what kind of careers. Yes, now uh, I am Gopi and uh, I'll get started. So I have uh, segmented this webinar into four segments. In the first segment, I'm going to be talking about the elephant in the room, which is the virus, the impact of COVID. In the second segment, I intend talking about alternative schools as an option. And in the third segment, I intend talking about post-COVID, will alternative schooling become a very important category in itself? And in the final segment, I'm going to be taking questions from the participants. So these are the four segments. So if you have any questions, I will, there'll be a particular time where admin will seek for it. You could send in your answers. So let me first begin with the first segment of the elephant in the room, which is the COVID, the impact of COVID. Uh, the COVID has had huge impact on just about everyone's lives. In my living time, and I'm sure for all of us, we've not experienced anything like this before. And obviously, schooling has been impacted along with it. And when you impact school, teachers, children and parents also have been impacted. So I'm going to first begin with Dr. Malati. And I'm, my question to Dr. Malati would be that, how has the lockdown impacted children and parents in specific? 
how has the lockdown impacted children and parents? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? Over to you, Dr. Manu. Uh, thanks, Gopi. Uh, thanks to KRC for this inviting me. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity to be amidst you. That's a beautiful question to begin the uh, session, Gopi. The reason uh, how it has impacted, uh, the answer is there. We are talking today about this. You know, we kindly, we completely understand the impact it has. I mean, it has on the people. Parents' schools are closed, playgrounds are empty, uh, children are at home, uh, teachers are working for the first time ever in the history, working from home. You know, parents have uh, taken the role of uh, teachers at this point of time, and then, you know, sometimes good teachers, sometimes not knowing what to do with them. It has a great deal of impact, and it has come in a crucial time where we have the admissions happening from the kindergartens and the competitive examinations are supposed to be conducted, where the results are to be announced. You know, we were in the middle of that, and then this lockdown has completely, uh, you know, blocked all those, uh, you know, the regular activities. This is this used to be a peak season for all of us, though it is a vacation for the children. But schools always used to be busy during the season. It's a company, everything has come to a standstill at this point of time. Uh, schools do not know what to do because there is an unprecedented uh, event which is happening. There is an uncertainty everywhere about the reopening of the school, whether the schools will open in June, July, or August, or are we going to miss this academic year? There is a lot of questions which are um, uh, in the minds of the parents. If I could just uh, bring in uh, Dr. Nandita and, and uh, Vidya as well. So what are you hearing from the parents? What has been the impact on children and parents, if you want to just uh, top up on what Dr. Malati said. I'll first begin with Dr. Nandita. Well, as far as, you see, we run regular schools as well as Saraswati Kendra. And I'll come to Saraswati Kendra separately. As far as the regular schools are concerned, the parents are worried naturally because there is no substitute for a school. You know, children have to learn to move with each other, to socialize, play games, things like that. Uh, all those we cannot provide till everything opens up. So what we have started, in fact, we started in the third week of March itself, the day the lockdown was announced. We, in our Grove School, we started online education. So the children were look, taken care of and on in the first week of June, we will start all the new classes. So that is unavoidable and I think that is how education is going to be until a vaccine is found for COVID-19 or something. Okay. So that is in an inev inevitable part of today's situation. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nandita. Uh, Ms. Vidya Shankar, would you like to add anything to what are the parents, children and parents feel? Okay. So the first uh, point is that suddenly parents are feeling overwhelmed that uh, the teaching, it's not so much as the teaching, but a learning child's time is, they are face to face with it. And uh, this is the first time that they are going to try to fill the day of a child, which is very difficult. Even if it's online, you can't engage with a child more than say half an hour, 40 minutes. It's so difficult to retain the child's attention on the screen. So what we have done is we have given advisories to parents and we have started giving uh, sessions over uh, online to some parents who will be able to actually translate it into work at home. So we have accumulated quite an amount of uh, information on where the children were before, they, before the lockdown. And uh, usually we do it with the children. And now we have given them the guidelines of first what not to do. Because if you become full-fledged teachers in the school, uh, at home, it becomes very unnerving. And uh, they, you know, get to see so much of uh, gaps in their children's learning and it comes, so, it comes so hard on them. You know, they ask vital existential questions on, you know, what have, what have the children learned thus far? What am I being faced up to? So these things we, I try and address and tell them that the learning curve so we have to see the big onus now is to talk to parents about finding the time to spend with the children in a very objective learning curve manner, which is so hard. 
so now that is slowly happening and the parents are realizing that their own parenting techniques are not uh, enough for teaching the children so they need to learn a lot more so they have to revisit some of the concepts that they have learned and understand the developmental psychology of children so that is where we are now supporting our families it seems to be working quite well i'm i'm going to go i'd like to, to add one point here yeah yeah uh, the parents what what may happen once the lockdown is open is that many parents may go back to work the children are going to be at home and are going to learn online because i don't think schools will open for at least another 2 3 months this is going to be a big problem if parents the last 2 3 two and a half months parents were at home they looked after the children that was fine what will happen when offices open in june and schools do not that is the problem i think we don't really have an answer for that yeah thank you thank you very much and this is essentially to size up on what we are thinking before i go to dr malathi i have a quick question to terence which is that uh, all of us are talking about parents and parents themselves are understandably completely confused even their world has turned around completely their workplace has turned around the business challenges have turned around they have their own challenges of coming from work in fact uh, uh, many of terence's uh, students or learners are also parents so terence you being talking to the other side of the parents of the children what are the pains that they are going through what are what are some of the thoughts that you have terence sure um good evening everyone and uh, thank you gopi so um we did a survey some time back when uh, the lockdown happened one thing that immediately struck us is how are the children going to cope up with education we were thinking about higher education and we were also thinking about uh, school education so we did a survey where we uh, spoke to uh, to the parents precisely on asking what do you feel about it what do you what what are, what is running in your mind at this point in time one thing which people were really worried about is not what is happening now they are comfortable now they are at home like our dig- dignified panelists said they are comfortable but they are worried about what's going to be the future what's going to be the future of education uh, children when they go to school how will they cope up generally we had seen that at home uh, when we see our child coming with cold we say that you know this has come from school and if that is a kind of uh, vulnerability that we have faced during normal times people are worried about what will happen in such tough times you know yeah. particularly when we talk about asymptomatic cases and it could be with anybody people are really worried about it parents are worried about it so parents what basically they looked at many of them is particularly when when some children uh, are are having little little illness that uh, you know they they could be having less immunity the parents feel that health is important my my child's health is important for me i am keen to look at alternative education i am keen to look at other means of education provided i get the right education and standards that is you, what invariably lot of parents told me about thank, thank you terence thank you very much i think that's an important perspective from the parent side i'd like to quickly go to dr malathi and ask her two really difficult questions and uh, one question is in her judgment how has the school responded to this crisis so that's one question to her the second question is that how does she see because she she set up 14 15 schools and she's constantly talking to many school leaders what is the chatter how is the schooling going to look like 2 years from now so there are two questions that i'm asking you dr malathi one is that how has the school responded so far that's one question and second question is how do you think the education system will pan out in schools in in the next 2 years but i also want to give you some data before you get started we did a survey and we found out that uh, only 50% of the children had 3 hours as less less or less classes 50% did not have any class whatsoever and even today 68% of the children prefer physical classes and uh, they actually said having parents around is not a good idea and they found that uh, you know many times now parents are giving live feedback to children students teachers 
you know, once upon a time they were coming only in parent teachers association. Now they're coming live feedback. So the data has been mixed and I would say children are still missing the physical school. So the two questions to you, Dr. Malathi, is that how have the schools responded, number one? Number two, how do you think schools will play out in the next two years? Over to you, Dr. Malathi. Okay. Uh, to answer you, you know, candidly, the, the thing is schools have actually shaken. Schools did not expect this to happen, especially uh, the schools in the tier two and the tier three cities. Of course, uh, in the metros, as uh, Madam Nandita said, you know, schools have waken up. They have started. Some of them have started. They have expected. They had the bandwidth. They had the infrastructure to start the classes online immediately. So they responded very quickly. But the schools who were not practiced, who were not used to, or who have not invested on their, you know, infrastructure in terms of uh, building up the technology, they are still shaken up. They are, some of them are waking up only now to understand because they thought they never understood the magnitude of this virus. So they thought, you know, things will go off, you know, by then, you know, we will have the summer vacation and we can open the school. Now, looking at the scenario, they are shaken up. They do not know what to do because still September is definitely going to be a long run. And this is the time for them to get the admissions, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, new academic year, how it is going to be uh, in the next academic year, will we be able to complete the portions or, you know, the new recruitments which needs to happen. They've, they've not planned about all those things at all. So schools are waking up now, but, you know, teachers have adapted those schools uh, where uh, they have taken action immediately and then who have jumped into online education to keep the children engaged and then to rope in the parents. They have very much adapted themselves so well. I could say that, you know, at least 10% of the schools across India have actually, you know, jumped into action, but 90% of them have not. This, this is again due to the infrastructure difficulties. And your second question is? How will the school play out over the next two years? Exactly. So this is, this is the time, as I mentioned, you know, they have... They have woken up now and they didn't know what to do. Now there is a lot of planning which is happening. Now after CBSE having released their alternative academic planner, looking at it, you know, they are also planning what can be done in our schools. See, to me, uh, you know, if you look at me, if you ask me as an educator, I would say that primary and middle school, it is in our hands. I mean, except the uh, assessment part of it, which is in class 9 and 9 to 12, it is not in our hands because we belong to a certain board, where maybe Cambridge or ICSE or CBSE. We, that is not in our hands. That calendar we cannot set. But until the middle school, uh, until the, uh, yeah, class 8, we have the liberty to rework on it. We can focus less on the academic part of it. And then that's what I have been advising schools. And the Sahodeyas are also working on that. We don't have to force, you don't, we don't have to force or complete the portions which is given. Usually the norm is when you set an annual planner, it is from cover to cover. You need to complete the planner. You need to work out the activities right from your, you know, uh, everyday activities to your annual uh, plans, uh, uh, annual activities that will be planned. But this year, the schools have decided that, you know, they will go slow on certain things and there is no need to implement everything, you know, meticulously, whether do it or not, you know, we don't have to do that way. Let us look at, you know, imparting the life skills, wellness part of it, and then, you know, let us change the assessment pattern, which we have been doing for years. I think, you know, that's one good opportunity for all of us here, uh, you know, revisiting our assessments. You know, how can we assess? Because now that the education is happening online, how are we going to assess the children? That's going to be another important question. I think that has also been thought over by the school leaders, which is a welcome change at this point of time. Thank you, Dr. Malathi. I think... Uh the right time for me to go to Dr. Nandita. If I were to just summarize this segment till now, we are basically saying that uh, uh, this is not new, that COVID-19 has kind of changed all our world. Two, we are finding schools are, some schools are standing up to the challenge. Some schools are struggling. Teachers are by and large gearing up. And there's a parent-child uh, uh, issue that's coming up in, in, in while children are learning from home. Now, this is the right time for me to get into the subject of the session, which is alternative to schooling. And I'm aware uh, Dr. Nandita's school has been doing fantastic work in the area of alternative schooling. And just to uh, bring all the parents who are attending the session, by alternative schooling, I mean a schooling which is not a state board or a central board, a school which is open school. Dr. Nandita has this rich experience of educating children who are either experts in arts or sports or humanities, or they're doing something else, but they want, for lack of better words, I'm using a lighter school, or maybe I'm wrong, Dr. Nandita might beat me up for that word, but I will use the word lighter. So I want to go to her and 
I wanted to ask her to take center stage and tell me, Dr. Nandita, what are the current alternative options for school children? For a moment, theoretically speaking, I say, okay, I don't want to do state board, central board. I want to do alternative schooling. What are the options we have in India? Over to you, Dr. Nandita. I think India has the best option for alternative schooling. I'll tell you how we found out. Uh, we have a school for children with learning problems, disabilities, educable children, but with specific problems, which we started in 85. Then uh, the time came when we said, what do we do? Where do we end these children? You know, a child can't stay with us forever. So at some point he has to leave and how do we decide when he's ready. So one of our parents who had a child with multiple handicaps, who was hearing disabled and all that, she found out about the National Open School. That time it was called National Open School. Later they changed it to National Institute of Open Schooling. So we registered with them in 1991. And then we in 1992, we sent our first batch for the 10th and 93, the first batch for the 12th. Now, it's a wonderful system because you don't have to do the multitude of languages and subjects that you do in CBSC, ICSC, state boards, and so on. And especially at the senior secondary stage, you have lovely subjects, music, art, uh, home science, and so on. You know, the range is just wonderful. And let I want to just mention here, you said it's lighter, etc. It is equivalent to CBSC, ICSC, State Board. If any of those can get you into college, so can this. So there is absolutely nothing lacking in the NIOS. It's an excellent system. How we got into an got into it as an alternative system was also by accident. A very famous musician, Shashank, you all know his name. His parents came and said he has no time to practice if he goes to school. And uh, how can he not complete his schooling? At least he should have a 10th or 12th standard uh, degree certificate in his hand. So at that time we said, okay, let's register him in Saraswati Kendra. Till then we had only children with problems, learning disabilities, autism, dyslexia, so on. Then we started just with Shashank. And we put him through the 10th and the 12th. And with that, we started a young professionals program. Now, these who are these young professionals? In fact, I would say we have produced more celebrities than all the schools in India to put together. Because we have musicians, dancers, Chinmayi, the background singer, uh, Somdev Devarman, the tennis player, rowers, tennis players. I mean, we have a long list. I don't even remember it. Our, list of celebrities is much more. Now, what do they want? They want time. They want time to practice because all of us are not going to end up in engineering college and medical college or something like that. So they wanted time by which they could practice whatever their strength was, tennis or music or dance or whatever. At the same time, they also wanted to finish their 10th standard, finish their 12th standard especially in a country like India, where girls can't get married. You know, that kind of... The translation is, how will it be married? How will it be married? How will it be married? So, you have to do something. So, for that, those uh, children, I mean, whether even for a boy, he won't get a good bride if he doesn't have it, hasn't passed his school. So, that's not the point. The point is that they wanted to get a school uh, degree and sometimes the uh, alternate career may not take off at all. You know, like you may think my your son is a very good tennis player, but he may not do well, so you may end up end up putting him in a course like BCom or something. So you had to have that alternative. So that has proven excellent. And NIOS is so simple, so easy. The a child can. Uh, to be eligible, a child has to be 14 years. He can choose his subjects. He has to be a minimum or take a minimum of one year after registra registering and a maximum of five years. Now, there are some children who don't have the time to do four or five exams, at, five exams at a time. 
so they do one or two exams per term so they finish about four four exams in a year or in a year and a half so on and then you have the senior secondary where you have to finish 10 standard now one thing in both the secondary and senior secondary thing is that supposing a child has uh, tried cbsc or icsc or state board and has failed in one subject he can come to nios and do that subject and i must tell you i have a very senior ias officer who wanted to do ayurveda but in her school certificate she didn't have biology and if i mention her name all of you will know her she decided she will come and do that nios biology standard 10 and 12 i am amazed at that lady because she had retired and she went back to college to do an ayurveda degree so that is the flexibility that nios gives you also you don't have to wait for the exam you know like cbsc and all they have their exams or icsc they have their exams in april or march april may whenever here you have even on demand exam so you can say i'm ready i'd like to do an exam and then they will give you the date the next chemistry exam is on such and such a date you can do that so it is so flexible now for children below 14 they have open basic education with three levels equivalent to class 1 to 3 4 and 5 and 6 to 8 if you want you can do that but most of our children we do our own we have our own syllabus till the eighth and then we put them into the nios tree so i really think there is no country which offers this alternative schooling i i can't see um i don't know what the us does they don't have any formal structure but definitely uk england they have gca levels o levels like cpsc icsc isc so on and there's no way you can uh, have any alternate system except study from the computer the teacher teaching you through the computer we have an alternative and the best part of the nios are the books they are excellent they are excellent and i really think the nios books should be used for every uh, board because I, i won't be very popular at the end of this their books are so good because even at the secondary or senior secondary stage they are graded 1 2 3 so you slowly you know grade yourself upwards so you when you do the third or fourth book whichever is the last you know okay i've gone through all this i know it there are different kinds of assessments right through so i am a big votary a fan of nios and i only have one big regret that when my children were growing up that <laughs> alternative was not available i would have put them through it but that was not there in those days you know that flexibility and the subjects they have are wonderful you know you can do it in painting in uh, home science home craft uh, word processing you know things like that so even a child who doesn't have time to go home and mug up big books because let's face it our examination system is mugging 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 at the 10th and 12th levels so even if you are not capable of mugging learning by rote at least you can go through all this all these books and you can do your final in say a home science and painting and music there you are uh, thank you very much dr nandita i think that was a an excellent conviction led storytelling for nios i would like to summarize what you said for parents one it is flexible there is a vast variety of subjects it is not it is there are special children but there are also alternate career children like musicians tennis who come and learn you can write your grade 10 and grade 12 it's acceptable in all colleges in india also pre grade 10 if you want to study you can always study there is a base curriculum that is mapped this is the summary And, uh, uh, I could just like to say one more thing. Sorry, yeah, okay. it's not just for alternate careers. I have got students who have gone into medical college, engineering college oh, after excellent. doing NIOS, that's and excellent. many children who are studying for NEET 
or J E E, yes. uh, they take up NIOS because it's less stressful. So they do NIOS and J E J G or J E. No, when I meant alternate careers, I meant they are singers and musicians. They can singers, also, but they yeah. also you can also do this. STEM so that it's well. less stressful and do need to J E whatever you want. Thank you. Now, with this background, I would like to bring in uh, Dr. Vid, uh, uh, Ms. Vidya Shankar, because Ms. Vidya Shankar has been enabling a lot of parents to homeschool their children. So while Malati has been, Dr. Malati has been experiencing regular school, and, uh, and you have Dr. Nandita who's been doing Saraswati Kendra, I'd like to go to Ms. Vidya Shankar and say, okay, you've been doing a lot of homeschooling. Your organization has made a lot of Montessori-led uh, learning pedagogy. I'd like to ask you what are the alternative schooling options and what has been the experience you had till date? Okay, so uh, initially we started Cascade Family Learning Center as uh, Mrs. Nandita Krishna. I, uh, I have, I'm proud to say that both my children, I dared to pull them out of school and I admitted them with uh, Saraswati Ketra Center. And today, uh, 15 years later, they are flourishing and they're in their own careers and they love the school. My son keeps going back and forth there all the time. So um, it's a I'm beautiful. So happy. <laughs> okay. Also, for the parents, uh, we didn't know that they knew each other. We just uh, got two experts, one from Saraswati Kendra and one from homeschooling. So it just turned out to be that their work yes. speaks for themselves. Or yes. do you? Uh, um, yeah. So the thing is, I get calls from uh, many, many parts of the country where they are uh, families are in crisis because one, the the children are learning very well, but the school standards and the way the child development understanding of the teachers is very poor. And uh, parents are very unhappy with the schooling setup. So that is something that is one side of the story. So where I have encouraged them and uh, helped them to form small groups. So I believe in not just homeschooling because it will burn uh, one out to just sit with one child at, in the house and sit one-on-one on one all the time. It's very difficult because you need a life. The child needs peers. And the best is when the peers are learning together. So I've helped small groups come together in the form of cooperative learning. Not a very, uh, I, I mean, like not a recognized uh, setup, not a uh, you know registered center for NIOS, no. But just informal groups getting together. So I have one such center in Vesanaka where we have uh, brought about 40 families we have brought together after 10 years. So this concept was really like shaking up, uh, you know, the whole system which was tied to schools to come into a space where they are free to learn. They also learn parenting. They also understand what the child development tenets are. Because this is very important for the children to grow up in a household where the parents are informed not only about their education because that is like in a school typically what happens is it's like they are called to the school and they are given inputs they are just given feedback now how to empower the parent to give the correct uh, what do you call support to the child is not there's no time for anybody to give that so when small groups are formed this is mutually you know, available. If there is one person, so I give them some guidance, they take on some course, they do some, uh, you know, they take on some theory lessons from me possibly. They also take on some additional training. They are able to guide a small group of parents and there is an ecosystem there that's available. So this has been happening throughout in very uh, down south, right from Nagarkoil, Erod, Karur, Dindikal, on in Gurgaon, Ahmedabad, you know, different places people have got in touch with me after seeing several videos I have, uh, you know, put it on YouTube on the need for the child to learn in her own pace with the cooperation and the alliance of the family. So this is happening and uh, I'm glad to say that many, many parents have taken the step to uh, move out of the conventional schooling as I might call it and put them 
put invested their time because this is investment into the future while they are talking of getting uh, resources in terms of money when they are working this is investing into the future so they take the time off to spend with a group of children learning together so there are a number of groups like that that has been enabled wonderful and and i'll go to dr malathi in a moment yeah. uh, in a moment she has she has she wants to add uh, for the for the uh, parents who are attending this session uh, i'm sure there'll be a lot of questions that will come up for you and i will try to answer whatever i can in the in this webinar otherwise you might want to get in touch with us so i'll give you an email id you could note it down it's admin a d m i n admin at 361dm.com a d m i n admin at the rate of 361dm.com so i think uh, my anchor just uh, sent uh, everybody so that later on if there are some questions i will take those questions to dr nandita we intend closely working with uh, dr nandita after this yes. so we will carry the question forward now i'll go to dr malathi dr malathi you want to add something to what uh, dr vidya and nandita just said uh, exactly w wanted to add to what uh, ms vidya said beautifully expressed thanks i was very happy listening to dr nandita as well uh, it's been uh, really uh, good to hear i want parents to parents to hear about this but when we talk about the alternative schooling and then the decision taken by the parents one thing i wanted to tell you know all the parents who are watching is yes as uh, ms vidya said it is very very interesting and then you know to work on the future of the children but at the same time we need to understand the kind of uh, you know time and energy it demands and also the space to do the homeschooling it is very very important when we start you know when we look at either doing a homeschooling or giving them an alternate education at least one parent should be completely dedicated and then there we it may have uh, the flip side will be there in case if we don't justify the job or when we run out of patience i want okay. to add. thank you my next question is to dr nandita dr nandita i am going to ask you a question about the uh, profile of the students and uh, i remember uh, many many years ago i don't want to take this celebrity name because it look like endorsement but i just want to tell you what happened this is india's possibly top 2 tennis player i was at his clinic and he had taken me showing around people playing tennis from all over the world and he was coaching them and he was then considering nios as an option because i remember what you said dr nanda he exactly said the same thing he said gopi it is very likely that if their tennis career does not take off they need an alternate career so it's important that i give them education and he said something which is even more important he said even if they do very well in their tennis career education is very very important so that's one profile so if you could first ask dr nanda and then i'll ask uh, vidya later what are the profiles of the students you've been doing from 1991 ma'am that's the question to you okay one thing i must tell you that uh, we charge according to the ability of the parents so though we have certain fees if the parents come to us and say we cannot afford the fees can you give us a concession or even waive the fees okay so we have got several free children several children at a concession so we have a very mixed bag because we are in a city which is a developing city and today the lower middle class is becoming middle class middle class is becoming upper middle class you know there is uh, the families the parents they are all moving so um, when you come to profile we have such a mixed bag in fact initially i didn't want a uniform just to give you an example i said no let's have it colorful let the children come wear what they want then i found one child coming in levi jeans the other one buying something from mylapur uh, cross and cross or something like that that's when i said no this is not correct so we brought in a uniform so that one child doesn't show off his wealth and the other child his poverty Yeah. so you know and another, just just to come in dr nandita one yes. profile is the economy economic profile yes what i also meant is you know do you have stem students art students humanity students uh, specially abled you know uh, the, yes. the, the regular school children what's been that profile i understand the economic profile you answered really well okay if you could just walk through the 
curriculum profile, subjects profile, okay. aspiration profile, what are they aspiring for? That could also help us, Dr. Mandir. Now, don't forget that Saraswati Kendra was started primarily as a center for ch to rehabilitate children with learning disabilities, problems, or autism, and so on. So as far as that is concerned, we have, we don't have standard one, two, three, four. That is something very important. We have a primary one, two, three, junior one, two, three, then prep, meaning preparatory one, two, three. Then of course you have a secondary and senior secondary. But this way, a child doesn't, you know, you don't say, oh my God, he's so old, he's uh, 12 years old and he's in standard four, you know. You don't have that kind of damning of the child. So a child may be very good in English and he'll be in a higher level in English and a lower level in maths. Our uh, teacher-student ratio is about one is to eight. That goes a little this way, that way, because getting teachers is not very easy. But uh, we have special educators, we have counselors, we have therapists, and we have subject teachers. So the two work together. So if it's a class of, say, mathematics. We are very particular that the children must go out with good English, maths, that's reading, write, writing, arithmetic. So in fact, our children are excellent communicators. And that, I think, is important because tomorrow, if you go to an a interview, it's finally how you sell yourself, not for the degrees that they are going to look at. So they, our children are taught to be, are encouraged every day, morning puja, their prayer, they are uh, asked to come, talk, each child is given a subject. So there's a lot of encouragement for the child to communicate. He talks with the teachers. We, every Saturday, except second Saturday, every second Saturday, every Saturday morning is parents' time. So any parent can walk in between 10 and 12 on a Saturday and talk to the teachers. So there's a constant interaction. And even rest of the week, you're supposed to take uh, um, uh, time, take an appointment, but they still walk in and we still give them time. Because okay. that I think is very important, the connection between the parents and the children. Now, one thing is that today, the profile of the parent is changing. You know, my, to start with many husbands and wives, go out to work. So the children are at home. Then there are a lot of single parent uh, children. They need tremendous counseling and leaving them at home because the single parent has to go out to work. These are all other problems. So our profile is most of the children who come, come for humanities. You know, not so much for science, but we have science, mathematics. We also offer that and they come for that too. But I would say the vast majority come from you for humanities and for other things like music and art and painting and uh, home science, things like that, because okay. they want something which will be simple. And Thank, you, Dr. Very Thank you very much. So I, uh, on one side, you have a, a students preferring arts, humanities, and you also have uh, students with special, uh, special needs. And you also have sometimes students with a need or a, or a IIT, J requirement or also enroll in NIOS. That's what I heard from the earlier. Those conference. are called the young professionals. Young professionals. That's a young professionals program. Okay. It's in the same, this thing, but it's. So you have all of this. Yeah. I, I now go to uh, Vidya, Sh Vidya Shankar and ask her that what has been the profile that you've seen all, all these years you've been enabling homeschooling? What's the kind of profile of the students that you've seen, Vidya Shankar? Okay, so I must be honest here. The first, I mean, like 10 years ago when we started, uh, we used to get all the admission inquiries only from parents who have, uh, you know, who are seeing difficulties with children, serious difficulties, learning difficulties, you know, focus, attention, and uh, physical, mental challenges. So that was the first initial, say, about a couple of years. For we did struggle a lot because when we say that we had um, you know Montessori training, we just accept children as they are. The one thing I learned was to uh, educate ourselves about the child through the parents. So I won the parents' 
um, trust in telling that you know your child well. So you tell us about your child and work with us for us to get to your child on the academic side. But over time, now I can say that it's uh, the number of children who are coming in are fresh, uh, you know, admissions with uh, no prior schooling at all. At two and a half, they come straight to us and who, who are not even looking at any other schooling. Then we have children who are around three and a half, four, where they have found that the children are having a certain resistance to a very liberated household where their children have allowed to have the freedom when they go into a very restricted house uh, schooling area, uh, arena it really works on them so the parents try to find out a little bit about uh, alternate schooling and they come so we do have about 10 percent of our classroom though we open it out to children with difficulties because that mingling causes tremendous uh, you know sense of humanity among our uh, students who are very well able as well as a great sense of kinship for the child who is otherwise you know not finding such a group of great friends who will hold him and support him through so that kind of uh, relationship but it's we give admission to the family and not to the child so okay. that is one difference here. that's a, that's a nice concept thank you very much Vidya. but i also want to bring in two perspectives who are not from the alternative schooling environment. But let me summarize what Dr. Nandita and uh, Vidya said. One is, it's for all profile. You can do all subjects. You can do at your pace. You can do at your, at your own grade. And there are some fantastic subjects which are there, which is not yes. available in a, in a conventional schooling system. In that summary, I, I want to go to Terence and Dr. Malati. Uh, Dr. Malati, I know you're an extremely open-minded educator. Uh, but I want to bring you into this thing that you've been, for lack of better words, I'm using this word, you've been in conventional schooling system. And uh, how do you look at alternative schooling? That's one question to you. In the meanwhile, I will also ask uh, Terence to reflect on when people take entrance examinations, Terence, for careers, does it matter that I studied in the alternative schooling? That's what question you could reflect on. Let me first go to Dr. Malati. And Malati, would you, how, what's your attitude or approach to uh, alternative schooling. Over to you, Dr. Mani. Okay, so we live in a society which is, you know, which has 850 million population, okay? Now, if you look at the number of children who have taken up alternative schooling, it's only a minuscule of the population. So the kind of openness, even when it comes to alternate schooling, as uh, both the panelists said, you know, both seasoned educators said, it comes from starting with the children with the special needs in the initial stages and then moved on to, uh, to, with the, to the knowledge society where people who have come from the third generation or the fourth generation learners who thought that I have reached a certain stage and then I don't want my child to get into a conventional school and then I, it is not that he has to go for a job and then earn for me. He, he should be able to find his own ways. That's the kind of a profile who get into the alternate school at this point of time, especially, you know, the elite, the elite I would name it as elite. But the masses certainly need, you know, the education is the only way for their salvation, if I have to use the word. Uh, that's the way that they have to, you know, get through the examinations. They have to be told what needs to be done. But even within that, you know, if you have seen the kind of schools that I have set up, the vast differences I have made, even within the system, the so-called the rigorous CBSE system, we have brought in a lot of differences. We have given a lot of choice, still class eight, as I mentioned. All the schools have the freedom to work on their, you know, work at, uh, on their pace. Children are given, children are divided into groups and they are given a lot of opportunities to come out and then work, uh, you know, uh, choose their kind of, uh, uh, what do I say that? Uh, they can actually pick and choose what they would like to do, performing arts, that has been given to them. If you want technology, that has been given to them. Even with the conventional schools, I have worked out, I have brought in a lot of differences that can be, you know, I will, I'm very happy to and uh, excited to invite you all to the schools to see that is happening there. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think uh, for another day, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Malati face off Dr. Nandita and I will do a little Arnab Goswami oh. another day. But yeah. I'll keep it for another day. Okay. No, no, no. I'm not fighting with her. I no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm cool in the sense that you need to look at the mass at the end of the no, day. No, you, you, I you're... can't because I'm running an ICSC ISC <laughs> also, which is uh, as structured as you can be. Yeah, no, no. Dr. Marathi, your, your answers were very, very reason led, and it just gave me an idea. 
I will move to Terence. Terence, you've been enabling yeah. uh, careers and, uh, you know, let's say I put my child in alternate schooling because I like the flexibility. I'm concerned about the health and I, okay, I, and I put them through and she writes, he or he writes the law exam or the MBA exam. And finally, when it comes to career, does it matter that I went to an alternate school or what, what, is, what has been your observation? Yeah, so I'll, I'll come to it. But before that, I just want to give a perspective here when it comes to who is going to get into the open schooling or a homeschooling system. So now we are talking about this system being created, let's say, for special, especially able children. And from that today, we are talking about people who are who, who already taken decision on an alternative career. They, they know that they are going to get into medicine or they know that they're going to get into JE. And hence, they want this, uh, their regular stream education to be a little lighter so that they can concentrate on what they want to do. Third is the celebrities or, uh, you know, people who have decided that, you know, I'm going to have badminton as my career or I'm going to be a tennis player. So that's another segment. But what is important now, there is a new segment which is getting created, which probably wasn't there pre-COVID-19. But today, I think there is a new segment which is getting created, which is not in any of this group. Basically, a very normal child with little wheezing problem or little a primary complex kind of an issue. Uh, Pre-COVID, it is quite normal for them to go to a normal school, mingle with children, and, and there's no question. We, uh, no parent had ever thought of it. Today, if you actually see a very normal family, a child who was going to a school, the parents have started thinking that his immunity is not all that great. He has primary complex. So how do I send him to school now when the school reopens? So that's the big question which is there in front of people and they don't belong to those categories. These people, uh, you know... So Terence, if I could just pause you here, essentially you're saying there is a, uh, if I just add and integrate what Dr. Nandita said, Dr. Malti said, and what Vidya said, and what you are saying, there is a young professionals kind of a segment. There is a celebrity segment. There is a lack of time segment. And there's a special education, which all the, all the panelists are referring to. And then you're saying there's a new segment, which could be, for lack of whatever words I could use, the vulnerables could be a new segment. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great summary. But if you could yeah. just flip it a little bit and say, okay, what about the careers? I'm getting into it. So, yeah. so yeah. When, we, uh, when we talk about careers, when you talk about uh, providing solutions to them, we should keep this segment also in mind. Now, let me look at careers. Let me look at uh, higher education and careers separately. So when I look at higher education, I don't see any problem, be it education in India or people looking at going outside India for education. I don't see any uh, open schooling or home schooling, uh, schooling to be a constraint. IITs take them, uh, universities like SRM take them. I, I see many universities which take people. There is no yeah. restriction in terms of who should come into uh, the mainstream education. So yes. it, there is no barrier at all. They can take a CLAT exam, they can take a CAT examination, they can comfortably get into any of the IEMs. In, in, in fact, uh, I, I should say that uh, NIOS as a body, like what Dr. Nandita said, they have beautiful systems in place. They've created wonderful curriculum, wonderful content. And uh, if I'm right, I think this is one where when you, when you get a certificate, it says Government of India. So which actually makes uh, makes it very comfortable for students to even apply for their education outside India. So there is no barrier, there is no restriction in terms of what they can get into. And uh, coming to careers, I think uh, like uh, what Dr. Nandita said and other dignitaries said, uh, definitely there are a lot of celebrities. I also went through a celebrity list of NIOS to see that people who have uh, seen who's, uh, I mean, what is what, they are highly successful in their career. They are known all over the world. They are from open schooling background. And uh, also, if you, if you actually see uh, what career they should get into, is there a particular area that you, they should get into? I don't think we can confine them into a particular area because I see students from open schooling getting into anything and everything. In, in my own team, mm -hmm. I have people from open schooling who are doing really, really well in marketing or business operations or designing and things like that. So it, it is 
not a problem at all or it's not that they should get into a particular career thank thank you talent said that you know there are some new age careers which these yes. people would love to get into that is what i noticed yeah let me just go to miss vidya she was uh, she was wanting to add something go ahead yeah. miss vidya okay uh, i just want to add here that both my children who took uh, nios thanks to uh, saraswati kendra uh my daughter uh, she did her post graduation in the university of hartford connecticut and she is a teacher she became a teacher a montessori teacher in uh, chicago she is now uh, in a very big school in hong kong she is doing very well and she is one of the very uh, well established teachers there and my son who was an artist and that uh, thanks to this school that uh, saraswati kendra that helped us to identify that he was an artist so he set up his own art studio after doing visual communication thank and you, thank he you. is yeah so this thank is thank you very much i want to just summarize till what happened and i want to have one round in the end so one the summary seems to be that uh, let me begin with what dr malathi said that covid has challenged schools some schools have stood up to the challenge some schools have not stood up to the challenge and teachers are fighting hard that's dr malathi's summary when i come to dr nandita summary yes uh, uh, nios is, is got great subjects if if she you know if we were to, uh, uh, the great example that she gave that if a child was young enough she would put them into the nios that's the conviction she has about that school and you have special children young professionals achievers all of them going through it and it's a flexible system there is something you can do before grade 10 and grade 10 and grade 12 as well coming back to what uh, terence has said there is no bar when it comes to career all all these schools are absolutely all right and what vidya said is that you know it's very difficult for a parent to pick the entire load you have to enable them you need to build the ecosystem that's a summary till now and what i'm going to do is that i'm going to just ask one question and i would request each panelist to give a 30 second response and finally i'll ask two questions from the participants my one final question is that as somebody who's lived the education system breathed the education system if some parents today make a decision of alternative schooling than the conventional schooling whatever challenges uh, what is your advice to them firstly you'll say yes go ahead and do it what's your advice to them so that's the question to wrap this session i'll first begin with dr nandita then go to malathi then come to vidya and finally i'll come to terence what's your advice To a, to a parent who says, "Yes, I am moving from conventional schooling to alternative schooling." What's your advice, Doctor Nandi? First, I would say assess the child. That's what we do. We would assess the child and make sure that he is ready for alternative schooling, because there are some children who would prefer a more structured system. So I'd say see what the child wants, because I presume you're bringing a child who's about 14 years old. He's a young adult by then. So I would say, yes, go ahead. It's an excellent system, but make sure that your child is also ready for it. Because if he's not going to bring in that self-discipline and self-control, or you are not going to also supervise him, then he will run haywire. That is the one thing I'd say. Because there are such few subjects. You see, in uh, CBSE, ICSE, they give you so many subjects. you have no time to run right but here with five subjects you can so either the child should be totally dedicated about whatever he wants to do or the parent has to supervise so Thank that you, is the suggestion so, i would give uh, it's it's a welcome thing assess the child be ready for support at home as well these are some inputs to you yes. i'll go to uh, vidya vidya what will be uh, sorry dr malathi what will be your advice in today's time if if uh, if a parent says i want to take my child to an alternate schooling what's your advice to the parent dr balathi i welcome them again you know to you know look at it but you know instead of assessing the child file i assess the parent ask them to <laughs> yes you know whether they are open for it it is not that putting in because you know with the so many years of experience we have seen parents who have confused the children totally because they were not prepared to train the children or put them in certain stream because they were you know grow, they, they were growing up in a certain so assess the parent Uh, make them understand you know ask them to reflect on whether the there is a decision that they have taken is correct for them to enroll the child so that the child has to grow up through it whatever expectations that they have they need to have a lot of clarity about it that's it okay Th that's good assess the child assess the parent have clarity i'll go to miss miss vidya what is your advice if somebody 
uh, where to say I'm, I'm taking my child for an alternate schooling. So when it is alternative schooling, actually it is the way the child is developing. Now you have to also understand that you cannot put your child in an alternative space and run a rat race. So you must be able to uh, synergize your life and be available for the child for the thinking process because the alternative schools give a lot of respect for children. It is not regimented. I know it because right from, because from my own children, right from the space to uh, I'm having now, we have very respectful communication with the parents, with the child. So that respect has to be cultivated. Uh, educate yourself on the uh, child development tenets. It's very important before you take any step that can you know, uh, be a life-changing decision for the child. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I think three brilliant points. Assess the child, assess lifestyle, assess the parent, assess lifestyle. And third, have your expectations set. You can't run, uh, you know, a, a, a competitive race when, you, when you're choosing an alternative form of education. That's a great point. And I'd like to go to Terence. Terence, what's your advice? If, if somebody were to take up alternative schooling, what's your guarded advice to them? What would be so I, I definitely welcome and uh, so parents should look at this as an alternative education system. But I also have an, a certain expectation from the institutions, you know, in addition to the wonderful job that, are, that they've been doing traditionally, conventionally, a lot of work that they've been doing. But in addition to that, I think there's a lot of new age thinking and a new pedagogy, new learning methodologies, which they can integrate. You know, particularly keeping in mind such tough times, they can look at integrating a lot of new things, new learning technology that we can integrate. Also, uh, you know, Gopi, the kind of research that you have done in, uh, you know, child learning and uh, adult learning, such research should come into play when it comes to homeschooling and open schooling. When the traditional system of schooling is integrated with technology-led, research-driven learning practices. I think it, it's going to be on par or uh, much more than a conventional uh, regular schooling education is what I feel. So definitely this should happen. Yes. And, and I would like to quickly uh, ask Dr. Nandita some questions that parents have asked. And, uh, you know, there's two, three of them I'll quickly run through. This question is from a parent, uh, Kavita Ramu. Uh, she is saying that uh, as parents, both of us are working. Neither of us can sit at home and teach my child, nor we have any adults to supervise them. Do you still advise homeschooling? That the question I'm is for. I'm not talking. No. Oh, sorry. Ours sorry. Is not, no, ours no, I'm is sorry. Not. Oh, yeah, Vidya, what is your advice to them? Yeah. If both are working and they're working from home, it's very difficult because the child will expect you to handhold and understand the child's needs and move forward. So if both of you are working and you don't have the time for it, please don't get into it because it also means getting a peer group for this child. Got this it. Will mean Got a lot, it. So it's not possible. Yeah. Then another question. This one is to Dr. Nandita. I'm, I'm sure about this. I'm a parent of a grade four child. Uh, sorry. Uh, I would like to know more information on NIOS. I'm a parent of grade four child. Can a grade four child join NIOS? Yes, yes. Uh, I would suggest they go through the NIOS website. Yes. Okay. Because if I were to give you a lecture now, you'd have to go continue for another half an hour. Yeah, but I'm, I'm actually enthused to do one more segment because uh, in webinar, I think we will have the record retention till date. Otherwise, I've conducted a you know, few webinar moderators and in my years, you will see people dropping ping, 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 ping. And that's fortunately it's not up. And maybe I'll do a series two of it and I will, I will ping sure. you later. And let me take up one more but question. Let them go into the NIOS web, sure, uh, sure. website. NIOS. Just uh, type it in. You will find out everything. There's a question from Mr. Varadarajan. He's asking that uh, how academic institutions which are not eligible to register with NOS can contribute to alternative education system. Gosh. Do we need to register with NOIS? Do we need to register with NOIS? Not required, right? No, no. Our center, Saraswati Kendra, is uh, uh, registered with NIOS. But what you can do if your child wants to do NIOS, you can train him up at home and just register him for the exam. So they can come and just pay the NIOS fees to the secondary and senior secondary exams. All right. So they don't have to be students of Saraswati Kendra. We have a lot of such children who are in 
Madurai, Trichy, in Kerala, we have a lot of them. Yes. And I'm going to just, just wrap the session. Is, is there anything any panelists would like to uh, say as a closing word or can I just go and summarize? Yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it. Okay, thank you. And I think firstly, uh, uh, my heartfelt uh, gratitude to Dr. Nandita, Dr. Malati, Mrs. Vidya Shankar and Terence. Uh, you know, what you just shared is your lifetime experience in, in 60 minutes. I respect a lot and uh, a namaskaram to all the gurus. That is, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all the parents to join. And as a moderator, my summary is that uh, uh, post-COVID is going to throw a lot of life changes, mindset changes and choices. And I definitely think based on what Dr. Nandita said, Vidya said and Malati said, and Terence said, alternative schooling is an option. And as you said, you need to make up your mind. You need to set your expectations. You need to be ready. Then alternative school can be a very, very grateful option. Grateful option. In fact, uh, the, the, some of the moments that stood out in the webinar was Dr. Nandita saying that, look, I wish my children were young. And Mrs. Vidya is saying that my children are so happy today. And Dr. Malati is saying that, yes, we need to have alternate systems. So uh, we will be in touch with you. If there's any question, as I told you, please write into admin at 362ndm.com. Our team will be in touch with you. Thank you very much and, and good evening. And we'll do another session shortly. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.